hang him on a hook and let me play with him? No! Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 things in classic Disney movies that wouldn't work today. You've got me all wrong. You don't know how hard it is being a woman looking the way I do. For this list, we'll be ranking the images, themes, scenes, or other aspects of classic Disney films that would potentially face pushback if they were aired now. How do you feel about these sequences? Do they bother you? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Let Me Be Good To You, The Great Mouse Detective Let me lift the mood with my attitude Animated fare intended for children generally needs to be careful with sexualized content. Still, depending on the social mores of the decade, attitudes toward content of this nature tends to shift and fluctuate. It perhaps wasn't a big deal in 1986 for The Great Mouse Detective to feature a scene where Miss Kitty performs what is more of an adult routine. Hey! The group of smoking, drinking, and carousing patrons hoot and howl at Kitty as she does her thing. All in all, Let Me Be Good To You is a fun song, but the scene is one that probably belongs to its 1980s time period alone. Let me be good to you. <laughs> Number 19. The Big Bad Wolf, Three Little Pigs Disney isn't a studio exempt from a closet full of insensitive stereotypes. There are some fairly egregious examples, such as this infamous scene from 1933's Three Little Pigs. By the hair on your chinny chin chin, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. This animated short from the Silly Symphony series actually won an Academy Award in 1934, while the sequence was still in place. It depicts the Big Bad Wolf portraying an offensive Jewish stereotype. The musical score adopts traditional Jewish violin melodies too, making no effort to hide the poor taste at play. This wasn't okay then, and it certainly isn't okay now, but thankfully, the wolf's disguise would be redesigned in 1948. Who's there? I'm the Fuller Brush Man. I'm working my way through college. Number 18, Puppy Fur, 101 Dalmatians. It's one thing for a certain scene or sequence to become problematic years later, but what about an entire premise? How marvelous, how marvelous, how perfectly, oh, oh, the devil take it! The basic crux of conflict in Disney's adaptation of 101 Dalmatians is that Cruella Deville wants puppy fur, lots of it, and she's willing to do whatever it takes, even dog napping, to get it. My only true love, darling, I live for furs. I worship furs. Right at the beginning, the character is established with a long history of skinning innocent puppies before she ever gets to Pongo and Perdita's family. We get it, villains are supposed to be villainous, but it's perhaps likely that Cruella's, well, cruelty would be tempered if this film were being animated today. All right. Keep the little beasts for all I care. Do what you like with them. Drown them. But I warn you, Anita, we're through. I'm through with all of you. Number 17, Hellfire, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's not my fault. I'm not to blame. It isn't an accident that Judge Frollo's song Hellfire utilizes an aspect of the actual Roman Catholic Mass as a melodic counterpoint for its musical composition. This is, after all, a film that daringly presents themes of religion, hypocrisy, and zealotry front and center. Hellfire was actually controversial back in 1996 when it aired, with many commenting about the frightfully realistic manner in which Frollo attempts to repress feelings of lust for Esmeralda. I feel her, I see her, the sun caught in her raven hair is blazing in me out of all the judge blames her for the feelings stirring within him, and this was not lost on parents or critics of the day. The scene featuring Hellfire is certainly awesome, but we question whether or not it would be executed the same way these days. Choose me or your pyre. Be mine or you will burn. Number 18. 
Number 16, Jessica Rabbit. Who framed Roger Rabbit? You've got the wrong idea about me, Mr. Valiant. I'm a pawn in this, just like Roger. Remember what we said earlier about sexual themes in kids' films? Well, it could be argued that Who Framed Roger Rabbit wasn't entirely aimed at children, and that argument would be correct. However, the exaggerated sex bomb that was Jessica Rabbit still became a hotbed for controversy, so much so that we're still talking about her today. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. She was clearly created to emulate the femme fatale archetypes of classic film noir. Still, we have a hard time believing Disney, in all their family friendliness, could get a character like her on screen as easily in the 2020s. Get out of here. Get me some money too. Number 15, The Lab, Zootopia. A lot of animated features contain jokes that are intentionally designed to appeal to adults who are there in the theater with their kids. 2016 Zootopia was no different, what with its fun nods to classic police procedurals in crime films. You come here unannounced on the day my daughter is to be married. Well, actually, we were brought here against our will, so... <laughs> However, this scene in the film's third act might give pause to older viewers. A ram named Doug is dressed in personal protective equipment, essentially mimicking laboratory scenes from Breaking Bad. It's a different narcotic at play, sure, but the visual is remarkably dead on. Doug's Night Howler serum may not be the same blue substance associated with Walter White, but the suggestion is certainly there. Hey, Doug, open up! We've got your latte. All right, Walter and Jesse are back, so I'm leaving now. Number 14, No Money for the Harem, Aladdin. The song One Jump Ahead features a moment when the titular Aladdin finds himself within a house of ill repute. The whole thing relies a lot on implication, including how he's treated by the women. They must know he can't pay for their services because he's very quickly thrown out. Aladdin as Prince Ali, on the other hand, well, the women seem to change their tune fast enough. Prince Ali, handsome as he, Ali above. You really have to connect the dots to get it, and the joke here definitely flew over all of our heads as kids. But it's highly possible that today's animated Aladdin wouldn't have even bothered to go this route. Let's not be too hasty. Still, I think he's rather tasty. Number 13, Pleasure Island, Pinocchio. The purpose of Pleasure Island, just like its literary source, The Land of Toys, is to present a morality tale. But they say it's a swell joint. No school, no cops, you can tear the joint apart. And nobody says a word. The young boys come here enthusiastically and willingly to engage in all sorts of bad behavior. These include smoking, drinking, fighting, and basically a whole lot of acting like jackasses. Literally, we mean, of course. It isn't long until the boys actually do undergo a physical transformation. What's going on? Ah! I've been double crossed! Help! Help! Somebody help! The sequence was total nightmare fuel for those young enough to watch Pinocchio in an age prior to internet spoilers. The sight of young boys braying in fear and pain mentally scarred so many of us. We think the execution of the Pleasure Island scene would definitely be softened to fit today's sensibilities. Oh, you too! Come on, quick, before you get any worse! Number 12, King Louie, The Jungle Book. At which point does the line of inspiration blur to become parody or even offensive stereotype? This is a question and argument behind King Louie from the 1967 Disney adaptation of The Jungle Book. Some critics have pointed to Louie as potentially reading as a harmful African-American stereotype. This was supported by jazz legend Louis Armstrong originally being considered to voice the role. However, the makers of the movie have confirmed that Louis is actually intended to mimic Italian-American Louis Prima, who was the voice eventually chosen for the character. The conversation about King Louis is still a current one. Meanwhile, the 2016 version of The Jungle Book skipped over the controversy entirely by hiring Christopher Walken to voice the role. You'll see it's true, someone like me. Can't learn to be 
like someone like you. Number 11, The Pastoral Symphony, Fantasia. The centaurs, those strange creatures that are half man and half horse. And their girlfriends, the centaurettes. Later on, we meet our old friend Bacchus, the god of wine, presiding over a bacchanal. The combination of classical music and animation helped make Fantasia a unique feature film for Disney back in 1940. However, modern prints of the picture have eliminated a number of controversial aspects of the pastoral symphony sequence, featuring music from Beethoven. Among them are a pair of female African-American centaurs. Both were animated with broad, culturally insensitive features and depicted as subservient to the other female centaurs. This, alongside the creature's casual nudity, ensured that the meaning was not lost on viewers. Musically and dramatically, we have here a picture of the struggle between the profane and the sacred. Number 10. Headlights. Cars. Believe it or not, there are a number of adult-themed jokes in this 2006 Pixar film that might fly over the heads of viewers who aren't paying close attention. Are you saying he doesn't have headlights? That's what I'm telling you. It's just stickers! Well, you know, race cars don't need headlights because the track is always lit. Yeah, well, so's my brother, but he still needs headlights. <laughs> <laughs> For starters, there's a blink-and-you'll-miss-it advertisement of convertible waitresses at a roadside truck stop. This stop for a quick breather, kid. Old Mac needs a rest. Absolutely not. Given that the world of cars centers around thinking, talking automobiles, that idea is a bit more risque than meets the eye. So, what are the implications of a couple of groupies flashing their headlights at Lightning McQueen after a big race? I'm Mia. I'm Mia. We're like your, your biggest, biggest fans. Good job. <laughs> Seriously though, the intent behind these scenes may seem innocent to young kids, but adults would likely balk at their inclusion today. Number 9. Salacious Sanderson, Hocus Pocus To be honest, the very specific humor of this 1993 film has helped it become the cult hit and beloved Halloween watch it is today. The tone does jump around a bit though, coming across at times as crude and sophomoric. One example of the somewhat adult humor shows up when Sarah Jessica Parker's Sarah Sanderson and her siblings hop on a city bus. We desire children. <laughs> it may take me a couple of tries, but I don't think that'd be a problem. Hop on up. Mom! SJP proceeds to also hop on the bus driver's lap, flirting and laughing with the driver as she helps with the driving. Hey, Buttercup, anybody ever tell you you very easy on the eyes? Cue the speed bump jokes, with the implication behind the scene being just a wee bit of fooling around. Brave little virgin who lit the candle. Oh. I'll be thy friend. Hey, take the fight! Number 8. Creepy Mushu, Mulan we can all agree that Eddie Murphy's casting as Mulan's guardian dragon comedic relief sidekick was nothing short of inspired, not to mention infinitely quotable. Say that to my face, you limp noodle! Shortly after introducing himself to her, Mushu tries to convince her not to judge a travel-sized book by its cover, boasting how all-powerful he is. Apparently among his abilities is x-ray vision, which considering where his eyes are looking, seems like an odd thing to say. My powers are beyond your mortal imagination. For instance, my eyes can see straight through your armor. Mulan's reaction of slapping Mushu is kind of warranted. And if we're talking dishonor here, we might throw it Mushu's way. Dishonor! Dishonor on your whole family! Make a note of this. Dishonor on you! Dishonor on your cow! Number 7. Conveyor Belt Doll, Santa's Workshop Aw, oh, come on, not even good old Saint Nick is safe. Unfortunately not. Early versions of this holiday-themed Disney short featured Santa and his elves hard at work getting toys ready for good boys and girls. Santa then inspects the dolls on the assembly line to ensure quality control. First, a white doll comes down a conveyor belt, says Mama, and gets approved by Santa. Then a black doll tumbles down the belt, says an offensive word used to denigrate black women, and stamps her own butt, prompting Santa to laugh heartily. This silly symphony was released back in 1932, but given the words ties to slavery and the doll's exaggerated features, it's no wonder Disney has removed this scene for several releases since. Number 6. Hidden Figures – The Rescuers 
Idle hands are the devil's playthings, or at least they are when they belong to a team of Disney animators in the 1970s. Ooh, I just love Pick Up! It's an infamous story. When the final cut of the animated hit The Rescuers was released, Disney employees snuck in an image of a nude woman, though you'd have to do a lot of zooming and enhancing to catch it. Captain, you fly beautifully. It's just like being on a roller scooter. Disney would eventually, nearly two decades later, recall the VHS tapes that contain the controversial image. But the scene where Orville gives Miss Bianca and Bernard a lift has become notorious ever since. Disney's Fort Knox level security nowadays would never allow this sort of slip up to happen again, right? Just went through a red light. Oh, don't I do that all the time, darling. Now, come on. Stop worrying. Number 5 Hook a Time Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> Consider this next entry a definite case of changing social conventions. Lewis Carroll's original story featured the caterpillar smoking a hookah, and has been adapted numerous times since in much the same way. We shall see. 1951's Alice in Wonderland is hands down one of the trippiest Disney movies, so we wouldn't be surprised if the caterpillar was casually puffing and listening to some Jefferson Airplane before Alice came to bug him. It's not uncommon to see smoking in older Disney films. Heck, just look at Pinocchio puffing on a cigar. But as the company continues to adapt to suit its impressionable family audience, this seems like something they'd steer clear of. Number 4. We are Siamese, if you don't please, Lady and the Tramp. Okay, we're sure you sang this as a kid completely unaware of how insanely racist it is. Over the years, Disney's films have taken to using stereotypes in their characterizations. One needs only to look at Everybody Wants to Be a Cat in the Aristocats to realize that the company hasn't always been kind to Asians in their films. A decade and a half earlier, two villainous Siamese cats, Sai and Am, are introduced to make poor ladies' life miserable. Well, if the slanted eyes and buck teeth don't offend, the gong noises, a common gag, certainly will. You want proof Disney regretted this? Their 2019 live-action remake replaced the sequence with What a Shame. But if you don't like our artistic flair, well, well that's too bad, <laughs> what a shame. I'm telling. <laughs> Number 3. A Crow Named Jim. Dumbo. Who knew that a film about an adorable elephant would have inappropriate content? Don't believe us? Okay, that scene where Dumbo gets drunk? Big nope. And these guys? Yeesh. We'll explain. The 1941 cartoon sees Dumbo and Timothy Q. Mouse meeting a group of crows. In the years since the film's release, their manner of speaking, as well as the fact that their leader's name is Jim Crow in the original script, have caused controversy. You see, in the United States, Jim Crow laws basically made racial segregation legal until the mid-1960s, so it's hard to brush this off as a coincidence. However, some say Dumbo's crows are simply parodying popular African-American entertainers of the era. Either way, it seems like Disney wanted to steer clear of any dispute, so Tim Burton's 2019 adaptation found a way around both of these questionable elements. Number 2. Native American Stereotypes – Peter Pan We're not sure if the powers that be behind Disney's Peter Pan intended for the tribe sequence to be insensitive. What we do know is this musical number would absolutely not be allowed in the modern day, despite its happy-go-lucky exterior. Even one of the supervising animators, Mark Davis, said he's not positive the whole thing would have been included today, at least not the way it was then. The company has attempted to remedy this on several occasions, ranging from writing the chief and company out of the 2002 sequel to a disclaimer on Disney+. Today, the scene is rather embarrassing in what's otherwise an absolute Disney classic. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. All of it. Song of the South. Gotta have a head, gotta get a head right quick. Need about this much tar, yes, just about this much. I expect this just about right for the head. That biggity old rabbit won't get away this time. Disney's Song of the South, derived from Uncle Remus folk tales, is infamous for a number of reasons. As many believe that the film marginalizes the impact of slavery. Even when this movie was being made, there was a worry that it would draw controversy. <laughs> I wish I had a laughing place. Me too. What makes you think you ate? 
course you gotta laugh in place. <laughs> An NAACP statement at the time critiqued, quote, making use of the beautiful Uncle Remus folklore, Song of the South unfortunately gives the impression of an idyllic master-slave relationship, which is a distortion of the facts. When the film was screened in Atlanta in 1946, Walt Disney quickly left, upset by reviews, and Uncle Remus actor James Basquette wasn't allowed to come, as the city was still racially segregated. To this day, the film has failed to receive an uncut home video release in the United States.